بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم دس از سوبیا کازی اگین آئی ہوپ یو آل آ فائن گریٹ ویل آئی ایم ہیئر ود اے نیو ٹاپک اگین وچ از نون ایز دا ڈیووٹیڈ فرینڈ اینڈ اٹ واز ریٹن بائی آسکا وائل بفور گوئنگ ٹو دا اسٹوری آئی شوڈ ٹیل یو سم تھنگ اباؤٹ دا آسکا وائل ایز ہی واز نون ایز ون آف دا ایلیگنٹ رائڈر آف نائنٹین سینچری and his actually purpose was of writing a story was aesthetic aesthetic means art for the art's sake so that's why his literature was much famous in the beginning he started to write down some poems and delightful stories for children from which the devoted friend is one which we will study and we will try to understand Now before going to start our lesson I would like to tell you that please keep your dictionaries open and whenever you feel any confusion you just underline that word so you can uh, understand it better by opening the dictionary Okay now I will read it line by line definitely so let's see The Devoted Friend by Oscar Wilde One morning the old water rat put his head out of his hole. He had bright beady eyes and a stiff grey whiskers. Whiskers, you know, like moustache. And his tail was like a long bait of black India rubber. That was the description of water rat. Now, the little ducks were swimming about the, in the pond. looking just like a lot of yellow canaries in their mother who was pure white with real red legs was trying to teach them how to stand on their heads in the water you will never be in the best society unless you can stand on your heads she kept saying to them and every now and there she showed them how it was done Now it shows what it shows out ke how she wants to live and how she is actually informing their kids to live in the society or face the society. Unless your head will not be high, you cannot live modestly. But the little ducks paid no attention to her. They were so young that they did not know what an advantage it to be in society at all. What disobedient children, cried the old water rat. They really deserve to be drowned. Now it was the mean comment of water rat who thinks that they should be, they should, they deserve to be drowned. Drown, you know that? to put under water or to immerse something. Now nothing of a kind, answered the duck. Everyone must make a beginning and parents cannot be too patient. So duck replied with the calmness, nothing of a kind and everyone must have a beginning and parents have to be patient with them. Ah, I know nothing about the feeling of parents, said the water rat. I am not a family man, in fact, I have never been married and I never intended to be. Love is all very well in its way, but friendship is much higher, indeed. I know nothing, I know of nothing in the world that is either nobler or rare than a devoted friendship. Here he gave the concept of friendship, that friendship is more important than love. And what, pray, is your idea of the duties of a devoted friend? Asked a green linnet who was sitting in a willow tree, hard by and had overhead heard the conversation. Yes, that means overheard, he was listening. Yes, that is just what I want to know, said the duck, and she swam away to the end of the pond and stood upon her heads in order to give a her children a good example. What a silly question, cried the water rat. I should accept, expect my devoted friend to be devoted to me, of course. And what would you do in return? 
said the little bird, swinging upon a silver spray and flapping his tiny wings. I don't understand, answered the water rat. Let me tell you a story on the subject, said the linnet. Is the story about me? asked the water rat. If so, I will listen to it, for I am extremely fond of fiction. It is applicable to you, answered the linnet, and he flew. Down and alighting upon the bank, he told the story of a devoted friend. Once upon a time, said the linnet, there was an honest little fellow named Hans. He was, was he very distinguished? asked the water rat. No, answered the linnet. I don't think he was distinguished at all, except for his kind heart and his funny round, good-humoured face. He lived in a tiny cottage all by himself, and every day he worked in his garden. In all the countryside there was no garden so lovely as his. Sweet William grew through there and lily flowers and shepherd purses and fair maids of France. There were damask roses and yellow roses, lilac crocuses and gold, purple violets and white, columbine and lady smoke, marjoram and wild basil. The cowslip and the flower de las, the daffodil and the cloth pink bloomed of blossomed in their proper order as the month went by, one flower taking another flower place, so that there were always beautiful things to look at and pleasant odors to smell. Little Hans had a great, great many friends, but the most devoted friend of all was Big her the miller. Indeed, so devoted was the rich miller to little hands that he never would never go by his garden without leaving over the wall and plucking a large nosegay or a handful of sweet herbs or filling his pockets with plums and cherries if it was the fruit seasons. Now, students, I would tell you Please open your dictionaries and find out the words. These are the description of too many flowers and fruits. Now, going to other paragraph. Real friends should have everything in common. The miller used to say, and little hands nodded and smiled, and felt very proud of having a friend with such noble ideas. Sometimes, indeed, the neighbors thought it strange that the rich miller never gave little hands anything in return, though he had a hundred sacks of flour stored away, flour you know that, stored away in his mill, and six milch cows, and a large flock of woolly sheep. But Hans never troubled his head about these things, and nothing gave him greater pleasure than to listen to all the wonderful things the miller used to say about the unselfishness of true friendship. Now, guys, you can listen and understand the story. That is a story within the story, written by Oscar Wilde. Again, in this story, you can understand the person who is least applying their true friendship qualities is giving the lecture on the true friendship and giving the lecture that what is the concept of unselfishness in true friendship. Well, new paragraph. So, little hands walked away in his garden. During the spring, the summer and the autumn, he was very happy. But when the winter came and he had no fruit or flower to bring to the market, he suffered a brood deal from cold and hunger and often had to go to bed without any supper by a f but a few dried pears or sears or some hard nuts. In the winter also he was extremely lonely as the miller name came to never came to see him then. There is no good in my going to see little hands as long as the snow lasts. 
the miller used to say his wife for when people are in trouble they should be left alone and not be bothered by visitors that at least in my idea about friendship and i'm sure i am right so i shall wait till the spring comes and then i shall pay him a visit then he will be able to give him a large basket of prime roses and that will make him so happy you are certainly very thoughtful about others answered the wife as she sat in her comfortable armchair by the big pine wood fire very thoughtful indeed it is quite a treat to hear you talk about friendship i'm sure the clergyman himself could not say such beautiful things as you do true he does live in three storied house and wear a gold ring on his little finger now they are discussing about the clergyman clergyman you can understand the religious church priest they are talking about them ki how they can not even give such a beautiful speech on friendship but could we riot ask little hands up here said the miller's youngest son if poor hands in the turble i will give him half my porridge and show him my white rabbits his son asked and gave some emotional thoughts that can we call him up and can we help him now what the reply of miller was what a silly boy you are cried the miller i really don't know what is use of sending you to school you seem not to learn anything why if little hands come up here came up here and saw our warm tire and our good super and our great cask of red wine he might get envious and envy is a most terrible thing and would spoil anybody's nature i certainly will not allow hands nature to be spoiled i am his best friend and i will always watch over him and see that he is not led into any temptations the side of hans came here he night asked me to let him have some floor on credit there and that i could do, could not do floor is one thing and the friendship is another and they should be not be confused why the words are spelled differently and mean quite different things everybody can see that how well you talk said the miller's wife pouring herself out a large glass of warm ale really i feel quite drowsy it's just like being in church lots of people act well answered the miller but very few people talk well which shows that talking is much the more difficult thing of the two and much the finer things also and he looked sternly across the table at his little son who felt so ashamed of himself that he hung his head down and grew quite scarlet and began to cry into his tea however you are so young that you must excuse him is that the end of the story asked the water rat certainly not and said the linnet that is the beginning then you are quite behind age said the water rat well that was the story or the beginning it was the actual message of a story that how some selfish people exploit your sincerity how hypocrisy can ruin your innocence is that the end of the story asked the water rat certainly not answered the linnet that is the beginning then you are quite behind the age the water rat every good storyteller nowadays starts with the end and then goes on to the beginning and concludes with the middle that is the new method i heard all now it's actually the method of a story as you know there there are three steps of writing a story one has a beginning middle and then the end of the story now here it is told that every writer is starting now from the end and then the beginning then in the middle he concludes that i heard all about it the other day 
from a critic who was walking round the pond with a young man. He spoke of the matter at great length, and I am sure he must have been right, for he had blue spectacles and a bald head. And whenever the young man made any remark, you always answered, Pooh, but pray go on with your story. I like the miller immensely. I have all kinds of beautiful sentiments myself, so there is a great sympathy between us. Well, said the linnet, hoping now on one leg and now on the other, as soon as the winter was over and the prime roses began to open their pale yellow stars, and the miller said to his wife that he would go down and see little hands. Why, what a, what a good heart you have! cried his wife. You are always thinking of others. And mind you take the big basket with you for the flowers. So the miller tried to tried the sails of the windmill together with a strong iron chain and went down the hill with a basket on his arms. Good morning, little Hans, said the miller. Good morning, said Hans, leaning on his spare and smiling from ear to ear. And how have you been all the winter, said the miller. Well, really, cried Hans, it is very good of you to ask. Very good indeed. I am afraid I had rather a hard times of it. But now the spring has come and I am quite happy and my flowers are doing well. We often talk of you during the winter, Hans. Well, we often talk of you during the winter, Hans," said the miller, and wondered how you were getting on. That was kind of you, said Hans. I was half afraid you had forgotten me. Hans, I'm surprised at you," said the miller. Friendship never forgets. That is the wonderful thing about it. But I'm afraid you don't understand the poetry of life. How lovely your prime roses are looking, by the way, by the by. They are certainly very lovely, said Hans, and it is the most lucky thing for me that I have so many. I'm going to bring them to the burgomaster's daughter and buy back my wheelbarrow with the money. Burgomaster is a mayor or magistrate of the city. Buy back your wheelbarrow. You don't mean to say you have sold it. What a very stupid uh, stupid thing to do. Well, the fact is, said Hans, that I was obliged to. You see, the winter was very bad time for me and I really had no money at all to buy bread with. So I first sold the silver buttons of my Sunday coat and then I sold my silver chain. And then I sold my big pipe and at last I sold my wheelbarrow. But I'm going to buy them all back again now. Hence, said the miller, I will give you my wheelbarrow. It is not a very good repair indeed. One side is gone and there is something wrong with the wheels spoke. In spite of that, I'll give it to you. I know it is very generous of me and a great many people would think me extremely foolish for parting with it. But I am not like the rest of the world. I think that generosity is the sense of friendship. And besides, I have got a new wheelbarrow for myself. Yes, you may set your mind at ease. I will give you my wheelbarrow. Well, really, that is generous of you, said little Hans. And his funny round face glowed all over with pleasure. I can easily put it in repair as I have a plank of wood in the house. A plank of wood, said the miller. Why, that is just what I want for the roof of my barn. That is a very large hole in it, and the corn will all get damp if I don't stop it up. How lucky you mentioned it. It is quite remarkable how one good action always breeds to another. I have given you my wheelbarrow and now you are going to give me your plank. Of course, the wheelbarrow is worth far more than the plank, but true friendship never notices things like that. Pray get it as once. 
and I'll set to work at my barn this every day. Suddenly cried little hands, and he ran into the sheds and dragged the plank out. It is not a very big plank, said the miller, looking at it. And I am afraid that after I have mended my barn roof, there won't be any left for you to mend the wheelbarrow with. But of course, that is not my fault. And now, as I have given you my wheelbarrow, I'm sure you would like to give me some flowers in return. Here is the basket, and mind, you till it quite full. Now you can see and understand and you can compare the, compare and contrast both characters. How mean character of Miller is, how simple character of Hans is. How innocent, sincere and loyal person Hans is and how many moral values he follows. Whereas on the other hand, you can understand the character of Miller that is totally mean, selfish and hypocrite. Whenever he wants things in his favor, he started to give different kind of speeches. Whereas, whereas if there is a turn of hands, he just neglect him continuously and give him some speeches in return. Well, coming to the next paragraph, quite full said little hands rather sorrowfully for it was really very big basket and he knew that if he tilled it he would have no flowers left for the market and he has very anxious to get his silver buttons back now you can see miller has taken the plank miller is now going to take the flowers miller as the story moves on you'll find how many different things he'll take and in return he is just saying he will give the wheelbarrow wheelbarrow you must know that thing wheelbarrow is a wheel cart kind of thing in which you can carry the things well really answered the miller as i have given you my wheelbarrow i don't think it is much to ask you for a few flowers i may be wrong but i should have thought that friendship, true friendship, was quite free from selfishness of any kind. My dear friend, my dear friend, best friend, cried little hands, you are welcome to all the flowers in my garden. I would much sooner have your good opinion than my silver buttons any day. And he rain and plucked all his pretty pram roses and tilled the miller's basket. Goodbye, little hands said the miller as he went up the hill with the plank on his shoulders and the big basket in his hand. Goodbye, said the little hens, and began to gig, dig away quite merrily. He was so pleased about the wheelbarrow. The next day he was nailing up some honeysuckles against the porch when he heard the miller's voice calling to him from the road, so he jumped off the ladder and ran down to the garden and looked over the wall. There was the miller with a large sack of flowers in his back. Dear little hands, said the miller, would you mind carrying the sack floor for me to market? Oh, I am so sorry, said hands, but I am really very busy today. I have to go. I have got all my creepers to nail up, and all my flowers to water, and all my grass to roll. Well, really, said the miller. I think that considering that I am going to give you my wheelbarrow. It is rather unfriendly of you to refuse. Oh, don't say that, cried little hands. I would, wouldn't be unfriendly for the whole world. And he ran in for his cap and trudged off with the big sack of his, on his shoulders. It was a hot day and the road was terribly dusty. The road was terribly dusty, and before Hans had reached his the sixth milestone, he was so tired that he had to sit down and rest. However, he went on bravely, and at last he reached the market. After he had waited there sometimes, he sold the sack of flour for a few, uh, for a very good price. And then he returned home at once, for he was afraid that if he stopped too late. He might meet some robbers on the way.
It has certainly been a hard day, said little Hans to himself as he was going to bed. But I am glad I did not refuse to Miller, for he is my best friend and besides, he is going to give me a wheelbarrow. Early the next morning, Miller came down to the money for his sack of flour, but little Hans was so tired that he was still in bed. Upon my word, said the miller, you are very lazy, really considering that I am going to give you my wheelbarrow. I think you might work harder. Idleness, idleness is a laziness, freeness, when you waste the time, is a great sin, and I certainly don't like any of my friends to be idle or sluggish. Sluggish again means lazy. You must riot minds my speaking quite plainly to you. Of course, I should not dream of doing so if I were riot your friends. But what is the good of friendship is one cannot say exactly what one means. Anybody can say charming things and try to please and to flatter. But a true friend always says unpleasant things. And does riot mind giving pain? Indeed, if he is a really true friend, he prefers it, for he knows that then he is doing good. I'm very sorry, little, said little Hans, rubbing his eyes, pulling off his nightcap, but I was so tired that I thought I would lie, lie in the bed for a little time and listen to the birds. Listen to the birds singing. Do you know that I always work better after hearing the bird sing? Well, I'm glad of that, said the miller, clapping little hands on my back. For I want you to come up to the mill as soon as you are dressed and mend my barn roof for me. Poor little hands was very anxious to go to work and work in his garden for his flower had not been watered for two days, but he did not like to refuse the miller, as he was such a good friend to him. Now, students, I would like you to assess these both characters. Assess these characters, write down about your opinion about these both characters. What do you think? Who was mean and who was sincere? Which character do you like? Do you think it would be unfriendly of me if I said I was busy? He inquired in shy, timid voice. Well, really, answered the miller, I don't think it is much to ask of you, considering that I am going to give you my wheelbarrow. Now you can see easily that how many times he is trying to impose or trying to reminding him that I am giving you my wheelbarrow. Oh, no, no, account, cried little Hans, and he jumped out of bed and dressed himself and went up to the barn. He worked there all day long, still sunset, and sunset the miller came to see how he was getting on. Have you mended the hole in the roof yet, little Hans, cried the miller in the cheery voice. It is quite mended, answered little Hans, coming down to the ladder. Ah, said the miller, there is no work so delightful as the work one does for others. It is certainly a great privilege to hear you talk, answered little Hans, sitting down and whipping for uh, his forehead, and a very great privilege, but I am afraid I shall never have such a beautiful ideas as you have. Oh, they will come to you, said the miller, but you must take more pains. At present you have only the practice of friendship. Some day you will have the theory also. Do you really think I shall? asked the little hands. I have no doubt about it, doubt of it, answered the miller, but now that you have mended the roof you would had better go home and rest, for I want you to drive my sheep to the mountains tomorrow. Poor little Hans was afraid to say anything to this, and early the next morning the miller brought his sheep around, around to the cottage and Hans started off with them to the mountain. It took him the whole day 
to get there and back, and when he returned, he was so tired that he went off to sleep in his chair and did not wake up till it was broad daylight. What a delightful time I shall have given I shall have in my garden, he said, and went to work at once. But some was never able to look after his flower at all, for his friend the miller was always coming round and sending him off on long errands or getting him to help at mill. Little Hans was very much distressed at times. As he was afraid his flowers would think he had forgotten them, but he consoled himself by the reflection that the miller was his best friend. Besides, he used to say, he is going to give me this his wheelbarrow, and that is an act of pure generosity. So little Hans worked away for the miller, and miller said all kind of beautiful things about friendship, which Hans took down in a notebook and used to read over a night, over at night, for he was a very good scholar. Now it happened that one little Hans was sitting by his friends when a loud rat came at the door. It was very wild ride, and. The wind was blowing and roaring round the house so terribly that at first he thought it was merely the storm. But the second rap came, and then he, the third, louder than either of the others. It is some traveller, said little Hans to himself, and ran to the door. There stood the miller with lantern in one hand and a big stick in the other. Dear little Hans, cried the miller. I am in a great trouble. My little boy has fallen off a ladder and hurt himself, and I am going to the, for the doctor. But he lives so far away, and it is such a bad night that it has just occurred to me that it would be much better if you went instead of me. You know I am going to give you my wheelbarrow, and so it is only fair that you should do something for me in return. Suddenly cried little hands, I take quite as compliment your coming to me, and I'll start off at once. But you must lend me your lantern for the purpose of light, as the night is so dark that I'm afraid I might fall into the ditch. I am very sorry, answered the miller, but it is my new lantern, and it would be a great loss to me if anything happened to it. Well, never mind, I'll do Without it, cried little hands. Well, students, I am cutting it short. It's already very long story. So going to the end, that what happened, I'll tell you. Just wait a second. What a dreadful storm it was. The night was so black that little hands could hardly see, and the wind was so strong that he could scarcely stand. However, he was very courageous, and after... He had been walking about the three hours. He arrived at the doctor's house and knocked at the door. Who is there? cried the doctor, putting his head out of his bedroom window. Little hands, doctor. What do you want, little hands? The miller's son has fallen from ladder and has hurt himself, and the miller wants you to come at once. All right, said the doctor, and he ordered his horse and his book big boots and his lantern and came downstairs and rode off in the direction of the miller's house little hands trudging behind him but the storm grew worse at last he lost his way and wandered everybody went to the little hands funeral as he was so popular and the miller was the chief mourner now, the, you can understand the story, what has happened in it, that in the last, Hans died just because of a miller, and the left property the, was given or taken by miller. Now, miller said, a great loss to me at any rate, why I had as good as given him my wheelbarrow. Now, I really don't know what to do with it. It is very much in my way, 
at home, and it is in such bad repair that I could not get anything for it if I sold it. I will certainly take care not to give away anything again. One always suffers for being generous. Well, said the water rat after a long pause. Well, that is the end, said the linnet. But what became of the miller? asked the water rat. Oh, I really don't know, replied the linnet. And I'm sure that I don't care. It is quite evident that then that you have no sympathy in your nature, said the water rat. I'm afraid you don't quite see the norm, the moral of the story, remarked the linnet. The what? screamed the water rat. The moral? Do you mean to say that the story has a moral? Certainly, said the linnet. Well, really, said the water rat in a very angry manner. I think you should have told me that before you begin, I have, if you had done so, I certainly would not have listened to you. Now, students, you can understand the moral of the story, that those who does not want to understand will not understand the message. So, try to read the story, try to underline the message, try to summarize the message and inform me if you want to ask anything. Thank you for listening. Allah Hafiz.